I'm going to be sharing a few moments with you this morning, a message called The Sword of the Lord and of Gideon. That is a quotation taken from the book of Judges in the Bible. We'll, let's read that together. In Judges, the sixth chapter, we have our introduction to this judge. In the Old Testament, judges were not like we think of judges, of, that, that we go to the court. Judges were deliverers that God put in charge to direct the nation of Israel. In fact, they were God's choice more than kings. The people craved kings because that's what the secular nations had and God relented and let them have kings and queens but God's order was judges men and women anointed by heaven to lead their generations and so one of those is this fellow here in Judges chapter 6 verse 1 then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years and the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel because of the Midianites. The children of Israel made for themselves the dens, the caves, and the strongholds which were in the mountains. Things were so tough, people lived in caves in mountains. So it was, whenever Israel had sown, the Midianites would come up with the Amalekites, the people from the east, against them. And they would encamp against them and destroy the produce of the earth as far as God. Uh, leave no sustenance for Israel. It, uh, Israel, neither sheep, ox, or donkey. The word destroy is a powerful Hebrew word, shakoth. It means to devastate someone, to violate, to harm, to ruin, to injure. It is used for a lion on a rampage. So there was just this rage against Israel. And they would destroy every living thing from crops to animals to people. They would come back for their livestock and their tents, coming in as numerous as the locusts. Both they and their camels were without number. And they would enter the land to destroy it. So Israel was greatly impoverished. Yeah, they suffered horrifically because of this injustice and oppression. Because of the Midianites, and they cried out to the Lord. So they cried out, they had backslidden and were in idolatry. Whenever they fell into idolatry, God's judgment, per se, was simply to lift his protection off of them. And then the enemies would take advantage of that. Then as they called back to God, repented, God would uh, come and rescue them, deliver them through a judge, through a leader like Gideon. And so his introductions found in verse uh, 12. The angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon and said to him, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. And Gideon said, oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, then why has all this happened to us? And where, if, why, and where are all the miracles our fathers told us about? But now the Lord's for forsaken us and put us into the hands of the Midianites. The Lord said to him and turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, you will save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? And so this first encounter, this God encounter, had a purposeful intention. My first point is simple. It's this. In every generation, heaven searches for champions that God can use to bring freedom to those being oppressed by the enemy. In every generation, so without much uh, research and effort, we can simply look at our world, our culture, our nation, and the entirety of the world and see a whole lot of oppression, a whole lot of people suffering, a whole lot of activity of the enemy, and God's solution is to raise up a leader. God's answer is always leadership. It doesn't matter what the question is. And so God's called you to be a leader by birthright in the kingdom. The moment you said yes to Jesus, you were put into the army of God. You were given a rank and an assignment. And you're here to be a history maker and a world changer for Jesus. You're here to make a difference. And so like Gideon, when God appeared to him, there was a duality of function, a duality of purpose in this visitation. First of all, it was to introduce him to who he really is. And so let me help you to tell you who you really are. You're a history maker. You're more than a conqueror. You're anointed. You're blessed. You're called. You're delivered. You, you, you're highly favored. God's goodness is with you. You're covered by grace. Your sins are forgiven. You're healed. You walk in hope. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You're in him. You're, joy, you're justified. You live in joy. You're a king. You're a priest. You're loved. You're, you're more than a conqueror. <clears throat> you're everything the Bible says. You are the Bible. You is a mirror 
And the New Testament twice calls itself a mirror to help you identify who God says you are. Gideon, here's who you really are. Gideon was working kind of a black market income, shutting out wheat in a wine press, but he was doing something. He had a little fight in him. It's amazing what God can do with someone with a little fight in them. And he's, he didn't like the injustice. He was grieved by the horrible pain that his nation was in. He was upset that God seemed to be absent. And so when God showed up, he, th that grief and that, that offense came out of his heart. Why haven't you helped us? Where have you been if you're really with us? And, and so uh, all those things were in his heart because sometimes frustration points us to our destiny. The thing that angers you, you're often called to change. Oh, I'm so upset about this politics. Do something about it. Well, I'm so upset about the school system. Do something about it. Well, pray and then do something. See, see, don't sit on the sidelines criticizing the players on the field. Jump down there, grab a uniform and say, I'm in the game, coach. What do you want me to do? <laughs> okay, so Gideon has this visitation. You're a mighty man of valor. You're going to deliver Israel. I believe in the providence of God, the sovereignty of God. I believe God wanted me on this planet. And so in Marshalltown, Iowa, 1958, and February 5th, I was born. It's funny, the older you get on those date things, the, the further you gotta scroll down to the day you're born. Wow, <laughs> going way down here. It's like, last century. But I believe my birth had a purpose. And that no matter what's happening in the world, there's a purpose, purposeful connection to why I'm here. I believe you're in Phoenix or wherever you live on an assignment from God to be a difference maker, a history maker. I believe God wanted you here in the last, you could have been born a thousand years ago, a hundred years ago. God had you be born now for such a time as this because he wanted you in the last day army of God. Okay, so Gideon is, is wrestling with God. This is a couple of things. Just let me remind you. Jesus said this, the thief. He gave the devil a title, a pronoun, a descriptive understanding of his nature. The thief comes only to rob, kill, and destroy. But I've come that you might have life and life more abundantly. The inference is I've come to give you back what he took. It's important that we recognize either by sin or Satan that the bad things happening in this world don't have the fingerprints of heaven on them. First, uh, First Peter 5, 8 says this, be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion. Seeking whom we may devour. When beautiful Mary and I were in uh, South Africa, the pastor graciously uh, uh, took us on a safari. And it was cool because, it, it, you know, it was a private reserve. Um, uh, and so all the animals were there. So we got to see, Mary had a list of like 15 animals. We literally got to see all of them. But one of them was, we're just sitting there and without kind of paying attention, a lion walked about two feet. And we're in an open jeep, walked right past us. What I do pray in tongues. <laughs> the lion was beautiful and intimidating. Satan walks around. Well, some people say, well, the devil was defeated at the cross. Yes, he was legally conquered by the blood and grace of Christ, by the atoning work of Christ. But his defeat has to be enforced by believers. Someone has to take the name of Jesus, the word of God, and declare his defeat. Okay, okay, <clears throat> second point. So Gideon says yes to God. Okay, God, I'm in it. And God says, uh, there's a beautiful exchange there. Gideon has a couple of fleeces, and, and Gideon makes an altar, calls it Yahweh Shalom. One of the compound names of God is Jehovah Yahweh Shalom, the Lord is my peace. And that's where Gideon made his peace with God. You, you can't really change the world 
as long as you're still mad at God for the last chapter of your life. See, you have to make your peace with God. God's not your enemy, he's your friend. God didn't make you sick, he's the great physician. Gideon makes his peace with God, and Gideon says, I'm ready to go forward. And God says, before you go forward, we got to go backward. You know that mountain up there where your dad has set up idols to Baal and Ashtaroth? I need you to go down, uh, go up there and tear down your daddy's devil. If you can conquer the stronghold over your family, you can conquer the stronghold over a nation. You are the one, my friend. You are the one called and anointed and empowered by God to break and conquer, destroy every generational curse that has ever oppressed and controlled your family. You're the curse breaker. You're the difference maker. You're the blessing releaser. So Gideon does those things, and Gideon calls the men of Israel, and he gets together 32,000 men. They, they respond to his, to his passion and to his calling. And so God says to him, that's too many. Now, it's over 100,000 enemy, and it's still, God says, too many. So a couple of things happen. And uh, in Judges chapter 7, verse 3, Now therefore proclaim in the hearing of the people, whoever is afraid and fearful, let him return and depart at once from Mount Gilead. And about 22,000 people returned 100,000 people remain. Second point, when you're no longer controlled by fear, God can use you to change the world for Jesus. It's amazing that kind of the first test that ended up being kind of a great filter, a great, a great uh, 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 not a crucible, but a great transition period happened when God said, if people are afraid, they're not really ready to change the world. We found out during, especially during COVID, had a couple of friends, you know, uh, call me from around the world. And, hey, do you have a word? You know, what, what's happening? Well, one of them, a, a really serious and a well-known person says, well, is this the end, Brother Mike? I said, no, this is a trial run. And they're gonna find out what works. And looking back now, what works to control people more than any instrument on earth is fear. So people became so afraid that very intelligent people did very unintelligent things. People gave up their logic, their reason, their critical thinking because they were so afraid. People did all kinds of things because they were blinded by fear. And so fear is a controlling mechanism the enemy uses and as believers, we have to conquer fear. It's not that we become always fearless without the, any fear, but you have to face and fight and overcome your fear. I've made it a practice in my journey when I'm afraid of something to do that thing until it no longer has a grip on me. You with me? Start off with broccoli right there. <laughs> Mary taught me how to eat broccoli. I conquered my fear. Still working on a couple other vegetables. Fear defeats us. Fear discourages us. Fear demoralizes us. Fear paralyzes us. Fear blinds, steals, and stops us. Fear hinders us. Fear is always a lie. Fear torments our souls. It oppresses. It controls. It disables. It deceives. It cripples. It harms. God doesn't want you bound, controlled, and governed by fear. I declare this is your season to be free from fear in Jesus' name. 2 Timothy 1.7 says this. Paul, writing to Timothy, said this. Young man, God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind, a safe mind. If you want a safe mind, get fear out of it. If you want a, a, a mind that's active and powerful, get fear out of it. Every decision you make because of fear will be a bad decision. And God wants us to make decisions because we hear his voice and we have faith in his promise. And we're led by his spirit, not because we're governed by fear. And 22,000 men couldn't fulfill their purpose because they were afraid and fear conquered them. 1 John 4.18 says this beautifully about God's promise to us. There's no fear in love. But perfect, mature, 
love cast out fear because fear involves torment. He that is fearful has not been made perfect in love. I like to look at it this way. When I'm afraid, I'm showing God a part of my heart that needs a fresh or deeper experience with his love. When love comes, faith blossoms. Faith is easy when in the heart that knows it's loved. And so I want faith to replace my fear and let love take over the terrain. God will help you. Whatever you've been afraid of, it's time to conquer it. It's time to defeat it. It's time to get past it. It's time, listen, life causes us to face challenges don't ever stop doing something God has for you because you're afraid. God will help you overcome that fear, and there's a victory on the other side of your fear. Third point, Gideon is rightfully, you know, he's, he's, he's down. Well, this, this is kind of funny. So they're down to 10,000 men against 100,000 plus maybe a million, a zillion of them. And uh, God says, still too many. Still too many. And have you ever been in a case where God waits till everything was so bad, there was no chance of victory but heaven? God says, okay, that's, that's, that's what I like. No way out but me. They, he sends them to get drink. 10,000 men go down to the river, get some water, and, and, and the, the majority of them, 9,700, just dip their heads in the water and there's gulping up. 300 men sat on their, they kneeled down and they scooped up water to their mouth from their hands. Well, those guys were chosen and I suppose there's a bunch of strategic reasons, but it didn't really matter. God was just whittling it down. So God's got 300 now and there's 100,000 plus on the other side. So that's a pretty intense battle. So Gideon says, well, you know, Lord, I, I know this is your will. I wish you'd confirm it. So Gideon and his, one of his workers goes on a little hike and they come to the midnight camp and they find two spies talking and they were talking about the dream they had the night before. And one of them said, I dreamed this dream and I know it was a dream showing that Gideon's about to conquer us. My third point is this, God is so powerful, he'll speak to you through your enemy. Mm. What do you mean, Pastor? <laughs> If God can use a donkey, he can use your boss. <laughs> he can use your in-laws. I don't I, He can lose whoever. Okay? If God can use King James Version, ass. If God can use an ass, he can use you. He can use people that seem that way in your world. <laughs> Sorry, sweetheart, just the Bible. Bible man. I believe something happens. There, there was these, in the Bible, there's these pivotal moments of engaged heavenly activity on earth. In all these moments, God just descends like a prophetic grace over everybody. And people start having dreams. The saved, the unsaved, the rich, the poor, the rulers, the the people of God, they all start having dreams. I believe we're in a dream world now, a dreamscape right now. And God's giving people dreams in the church, out of the church, because he's visiting the earth. And this, this last great, like Pastor George talked about, this last great move of God, so many hearts will be open because they've had encounters with God in their dreams or in their life. They don't even know what it means exactly. But watch what God can do through dreams. Fourth point. So Gideon recognizes as a leader, he's had these dramatic angelic encounters, God encounters, God speaking to him, God confirming his will. But 300 men are following Gideon because Gideon heard from God. They've not had God encounters. They're just following the guy who did. And so if Gideon's fighting fear, imagine the intimidation Imagine the kind of battle they're facing. And so Gideon says, here, here, fellas, I'm never going to ask you to do something I don't do first. The four, fourth point is this. Look at me and do what I do. The greatest, most biblical, and most powerful 
method of leadership in the earth is leadership by example. When you want someone to do something, do it first. You with me? My, this is a bad example. My, my earliest childhood memory, and Doc, this is probably a trauma, not a memory. So I'm like two and a half, three, and I was born in Marshalltown, Iowa, and I'm, my, my dad is on, with some friends in the, in the kitchen, and, and he calls me, Mickey, they call me Mickey, Mickey, come here. I come in there. And so he looked at me, and, he, and he's holding a beer in one hand and a cigarette in the other. And he says, if I ever catch you drinking or smoking, I'm going to beat the hell out of you. <laughs> and then the guys all start laughing. But I looked up, you know, all I saw was what he was doing, not what he was saying. <laughs> now, we, so let's talk about this because the church, we practically invented hypocrisy, okay? So we, 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 we're familiar with it. People, I was having, you know, someone was, you know, fighting me a little bit the other day. Oh, you, you church people are all hypocrites. I said, I know. Isn't that a great place for hypocrites to be touched by God? They got to go someplace. Let's not send them to hell. Let's send them to church. <clears throat> Hypocrites welcome. So, <laughs> so, but I learned as a father and as a leader that to have moral authority, you have real spiritual authority. I can't ask people to do something I'm unwilling to do. I never have a hard time asking people to give financially. Well, Mary and I are aggressive givers. You know, without, I'll just, I'll just say this, first time I've said it, I just gave away my 20th car to a family in the church. I always pray about doing things, I gave it away. And that was the 20th time I've done it. And I was to a wonderful family. And 20 times God's Give me testimonies. Now, I only said that to say this. I'm a pretty aggressive giver. My wife has to give me a list of things I can't give away. <laughs> Kids, grandkids. <laughs> that, 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 that. She came to church once, and I'm in my early 30s, and I, I was just so inspired. I was so on fire. I prayed all night. I'm, church, I'm preaching church. I said, Tell me, I'm giving away everything I own, and I hadn't bothered to tell her. I'm giving away all my furniture. Everything's going out the door today. She, her eyes got real big. Tears coming down her cheeks. I found out that's not the best way to do things. There are certain things I wish I was better at because I know the church would probably they'd be more dominant here. So I see my strengths and weaknesses in my kids in the church, my world, and it makes me want to be better at things I'm not good at. It makes me want to, you know, improve things. It makes me want to be a better example in every part of my life. I know one thing for sure. My children never saw me once in 45 years raise my voice to my wife. They never saw me dishonor her by word or action. They saw me love her, and I knew that was showing my sons how to treat their wives and showing my daughters how they should be treated. <laughs> Look at me and do what I do. And so his strategy, his strategy was amazing. So they each were given a trumpet. It would be a, like a ram's horn, a shofar. And then they each were given a, a clay vessel, a rather large one, and inside of it was a lit torch. And so they're going to blow the trumpet, break the vessel, raise the torch, and then shout these three actions. And, and, and so they blow the trumpet. I, I just want to say this. There was so much power in unity. The reason why the devil's attacking your marriage, and he, he wants to weaken the force of what you could be together, a dynamic duo changing the world. And so when we come to unity in home and church and life and business, there's power in agreement. Jesus said like this, any two of you agree, symphonio, come into harmony as touching anything, about anything, 
in prayer it will be done. What an important prayer. Let's agree together and pray. So they're going to blow their trumpets. The second thing is they're going to break their torches and or to break their vessels and show their torches. I just want to say this just for, uh, I want to throw this out there. There is a glory in you that only brokenness can bring out of you. I want to get to the shouting one after this one. And so everyone wants to shine. No one wants to be broken. And I'm not talking about life's crushing moments, but I'm talking about real contrition and brokenness and humility. The Bible elevates humility as being a, a vitally important behavior. And the Bible says this, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. He, he will exalt you. He will exalt you. Jesus said, if you humble yourself like these children, you'll be great in my kingdom. Humility is often the breaking of our lives and transparency and honesty. I remember when I first started being really honest about my story, I was always afraid to tell people that I had been suicidally depressed and so down and so and so miserable and so defeated. But when I, I go around the world... And the first time I'm at a place, I always tell my testimony. And without fail, every place I go, people forget my sermons. They never forget my testimony. That's the guy that Jesus healed from depression. There's a glory in you. The devil thinks he's defeating you. Ah, but he's going to see glory come out of this. He's going to see radiant glory come out of your story. The third thing they did in union is they shouted this. It took me years to really capture, I think, the fullness of what was happening here. They shouted the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Well, it took me forever because I thought it was presumptuous for Gideon to kind of tack on his name to what God was doing. But God blessed it. God sanctioned it. In fact, God directed it. And it's this principle that God needs human partners. And so God's looking for someone that your story can be the sword of the Lord and, and maiden. The sword. And, and so they shouted that shout. And the enemy started destroying themselves. In fact, more people were killed by the Midianites fighting among themselves. A, a heaven-sent confusion came upon them. And 300 men defeated 100,000 men. Now, a couple points about this sword of a Lord idea, this, this principle. There's so much power in your testimony. There's so much power in the lightning revelation of God's word in your soul that comes out by the things you say. In the New Testament, the Greek word for two-edged sword is di two stomos mouths, two mouths. And I get it now. It took me, I don't know, maybe about 10 years. I finally got it. Diastomos, a two-edged sword, is when God talks to me from the canon of Scripture or by a prophetic moment, he gives me a half of the sword. It's not a weapon, though, until I add my mouth to his mouth. And when I say what I've heard, I'll see what I say. God can't do it until you say it. God didn't think, let there be light. God didn't write. Mm -hmm. God said, let there be light. He created this world from that world. That world governs this world. And the thing that governs that world is the word of God. And when the word of God is found in the mouth of God's people on this world, the will of God is allowed to be transmitted, to be released, and be powerfully uh, uh, de declared and delivered to people. So it's essential that we unite with God and hear from God. God can't bless it, my friend, until you stop cursing it. You with me? I didn't say cussing it. I said cursing it. A curse is any declaration in disharmony with God. 
I curse things by disagreeing with God about what he's made them to be or do. I, when, when I mislabel, misidentify something, I curse it. How do we break curses? We break our agreement with the devil. Every lie that's ever been told you. Every identity belief that's contrary to God's promise is a curse you have to break from your soul. Every controlling belief that has disengaged your destiny, displaced your passion, that has stolen your vision and robbed your joy, you got to tear that down and conquer it. The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. God can't do it. It's been in my journey such an important feature that, brought, that God brought such corrective guidance to my vocabulary. And I'm watchful and very intentional about the things I say. And I want to find God's heart about things and agree with him. Anybody can say how bad things are. Kingdom people prophesy how good God's going to make them. Hearing something different. <laughs> I, get, I had a word for a famous person a few months ago. It's just so fun. It was word of knowledge and um, they told me no one knows that. You just said something. No one on the planet but that family, that couple knows this. But God knows. Someone that's probably commonly cursed by so many Christians, just discarded and, and oh, da, 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 da. be careful. You're not cursing someone God's trying to bless. Be careful. Come on. So, so the sword of the Lord is in Gideon. What, what does it mean to me? Man, there's stuff God wants to change. He's just looking for someone he can use. Someone that will come into a harmony of agreement and someone whose vocabulary will be filled with his word. God, help us to be those people. Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Whatever is happening in your world, find what God is saying. Agree with him. Joel 3 says this, let sick people say they're strong. Thank you, God, for your promise. And thank you, CF10, for listening to me today. That's it. Would you stand to your feet, please? <laughs> Prayer to me if you join me down front. Say this out loud. Thank you, Father. For giving me salvation through Jesus Christ. Thank you for such a time as this. I'm alive. I agree today that you've called me to be a history maker, a world changer. And I ask you to fill me with wisdom, revelation, insight and passion to do your will. Show me what you want to do. And I will say it and do it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lord. Our highest honor every service, every gathering, every day, and every outreach of this church is to pray with people to come to know Jesus. And if you've never received him as your Savior and Lord, the Bible says we believe in our heart for righteousness and we speak with our mouth for salvation. We'd be so honored to pray with you today. If you've been away from God, I'm proud of you watching or making the church. Welcome home. Let someone pray with you. If you need a healing in your body or your mind, we believe there's nothing in your world that prayer can't bring God into. And when God touches it, it heals. We'd be so honored to pray for you. And maybe you're just going through like the toughest week of your life or season. And you're in a storm. Let someone agree with you. Let someone speak life and faith to you. Just for 90 seconds longer, church, would you please worship the Lord with me while those seeking prayer come forward? If you, if you want prayer today, would you please join us down in front, church? Would you worship the Lord with us? while those uh, seeking prayer come forward.